And we're delighted to be joined now by one of our regular contributors here on Wall Street. He's Glenn Hubbard, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, certainly of Columbia Business School, and most important for this purpose, the author of the new book, The Wall and the Bridge. Glenn, thank you so much for being back with us. It's a fascinating book, an important book. In reading through it, I have the strong sense part of your motivation was you have some concerns for the future of capitalism, because to some extent, inherent in capitalism is a dynamism and a creativity that can lead to some destructive qualities. I think that's 100% right, David. You know, it's, it's like a coin with two sides. Economists, policymakers, business people, we often talk about the growth and dynamism side of capitalism. That's why we're in the game. It's hugely important. The flip side of its disruption. Uh, many of us, frankly, most of us win from a lot of the disruptions I talk about in the book, but not everybody. And I think we have to notice those who have been left behind and figure out how do we get everybody to be able to participate in our economy? Not a new idea. It was actually Adam Smith's idea. We need to put the liberal back in neoliberalism, classical liberal, that is, a la Smith. Uh, let me ask you, Glenn, as an economist, does uh, dynamic capitalism inherently lead to increasing inequality? Uh, I don't know about that, but it certainly needs to generate churn and disruption. You know, many jobs and industries that exist today didn't exist 100 years ago. That's the, the good news. The flip side of that is that people's livelihoods, communities, firms, and industries can be at risk. That, too, is not a bad thing as long as we prepare people. You know, when Adam Smith talked about the wealth of nations, he talked about competition and openness, and those are good things. But I think if Smith were alive today, he would talk about the ability to compete. In the world we have with technological change and globalization, is everybody really at the starting line? I think that's the inequality that would have worried Smith and should worry us. Uh, Glenn, in your book, there's a lot of talk about dynamism, creativity, innovation, and how important that is for a society, for growth, and for the individuals in it. At the same time, you have a distributive notion as well called mass flourishing, that you actually go back to Adam Smith and say, Man, this was consistent with Adam Smith. Talk to us about mass flourishing. Well, mass flourishing is more than GDP. You know, when Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, there was no GDP, although he did talk about maximizing the size of, of output. Uh, I also think, though, of the Smith of the theory of moral sentiments, where he used an expression, mutual sympathy, that today we might call empathy. I think the right economic idea is everybody in the book, everybody participating, everybody flourishing. And to the minds of the classical economists, flourishing meant participating in the economy, the ability to have meaningful work. And I think that's really what the book is about. How do you build bridges to that kind of work a bridge either takes you to somewhere or brings you back. And taking you to could be preparing you for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And taking you back is rethinking social insurance. Do we have a way to reconnect people who fall out of the boat to the boat? And what if you knew for a certainty that in order to have truly mass flourishing, you had to give up some of the dynamism? Would you make that trade? I wouldn't. And that's the point of the book. It's I think there are a number of people that I... Um, uh, note in the book that Adam Smith would school if he were here today that suggests that you can just sort of haircut dynamism. The real issue is compensating people who've been left behind. We, we have old expressions in economics. The same professor who told you that uh, trade is good or technological advances are good, he or she also told you that's because the gainers can compensate the losers. And by compensation, what I talk about is not writing people a check or pensioning them off but investing in getting people connected, preparing people for work, uh, and preparing people who got left behind. That's something we used to do in the country. The land-grant colleges of the 19th century, the GI Bill of the 20th century. I suggest ways we could bring those life to life today. Your book is The Wall and the Bridge. Uh, talk about the wall before we get to the bridge, because as you point out, we've had some people really eager to rebuild some walls, if not physical walls, and some of them are physical, then certainly walls of tariffs, walls of regulation, walls of restriction. Well, walls are easy and seductive. They're, they're very popular in history, be they physical walls or anti-innovation, anti-trade, uh, anti-immigrant. They're easy to explain to people. I can make the world like it used to be. I can make it comfortable to you. There are two problems with that. 
One is that you're giving up on all the dynamism of openness, whether it's openness abroad or openness at home, you're giving up on competition. And the other is you can't really make the world like it used to be. So the antidote to the wall is not the kind of let it rip economics of laissez-faire or in the contemporary worlds or what neoliberal economists talk about. The real antidote is the bridge. And that really goes back to what classical liberal economists like Smith and others talked about. And bridges in today's society are about education, they're about training, but first of all, they're about noticing. They're about noticing that not everybody is in the same boat and how do you pull that off? You know, I, I tell a story in the book that to my mind, the Queen of England asked the best question of the entire financial crisis when she asked faculty at the London School of Economics, why did nobody see it coming? Why did nobody notice? I think what the Queen meant was how could things be so important and slow moving and you didn't see it? You could ask the same thing about technological advance and globalization. We need to address these concerns. They're real. And if we don't put up bridges, we'll get walls. You know, we hear the debates about capitalism versus socialism. I don't think that's what's going on. It's really both the right and the left are serving up walls to voters and business people. We need bridges. Uh, so let me ask the maybe provocative question, Glenn. Is it too late to build those bridges? Can we go back in and retrain people for the new economy? It's not too late, and the stakes are going to get larger. Let me, let me take both those uh, in turn. We can invest in communities and people. So in the book, I talk about a modern version of place-based aid, of helping communities develop business services that are right for their areas. I also talk about a large block grant to support community colleges. Rather than talking about a free tuition movement, what about the resources to help community colleges adapt people and their skills for the jobs that are? We can do this. And the problem's about to get bigger. You know, while the book looks at technological advances in globalization of the past few decades, we're in an era in which artificial intelligence and machine learning on the one hand and the adaptation to climate change on the other are going to affect millions of workers in the economy. We need to get this right. It's not only not too late, it's essential to do it right now. Uh, Glenn, how do we invest in community colleges, which as you say, really offer a lot of potential promise and hold them accountable at the same time? Because you and I both know some places that works well, some places it really doesn't work well. A lot of people go to those community colleges, borrow a lot of money, don't get the certificates, and really just end up with a lot of debt. It's a great question, and the goal should not be to, quote, get people to go to community college or, for that matter, four-year college. The goal should be to get them to complete a meaningful degree. So in the book, I talk about mechanisms for funding that would restore two-year college funding to the level of funding states are providing four-year colleges, but measuring accountability by completion, by providing student services that help lead to completion and to jobs that are meaningful in local economies. So is it easy or a silver bullet? No. Is it doable? Absolutely yes. We've done these big things in America before, and we need to think bigger about doing them again.